welcome to Money Matters TV. I am your host, Doug Hepburn of Hepburn Financial Advisors, a boutique wealth management firm located in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. We've been offering uh, trusted advice to successful individuals, families, and businesses for over 20 years. I'd like to introduce my co-host, Ken Jordan, a branch manager at Princeton Mortgage. Hi, Ken. Tell me something Hello, good Doug, in your world. Hello, Doug. How are you? Great, thanks. Tell me something good in your world. Something good. Wow. It's, it's a stretch, man. It's a stretch. <laughs> interest rates, interest rates, interest rates. They didn't raise them today. How's that? That's some something good, right? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, the rates have been longer and, and higher than anyone expected. Um, do you see that changing? And how's that how's that impacting your uh, your business? I'll tell you, the, it, they are higher. And they've been higher longer than anyone expected. There are a lot of people that felt like we were going to see something in the fives for long-term mortgage rates in uh, Q4 and just hasn't happened. Uh, not sure if it will at this point. Um, right. But uh, it's it's definitely, you know, it's impacting the market and in buyer's affordability and seller's willingness to sell. If they're, you know, if they have to sell, if they have to give, give up their four and a half, their 3% interest rate uh, to buy in the in the high sevens and eights, it's really disincentivizing them and causing all kinds of supply issues. So what what can buyers do right now to save money? There's a couple things buyers can do. One is really take a look at the arms, right? I mean, we're looking at adjustable rate mortgages um, that are in some cases, three quarters of a percent to a full percent lower than 30 year fixed rate mortgages. And you're still getting a fixed rate term. You get a three year term or a five year term or a seven year term where the, the rate is fixed and it can't adjust until after that three year or five year period. That's one way a lot of buyers are choosing to try and save some money in the interim until hopefully rates do come down. That makes sense. I guess the buyer is really taking the risk that the rates could potentially go up after that three year period. But with rates where they are now, it would seem the likelihood of them going down is is higher. Um, you know, are, are there buyers still looking? Yes, that's the crazy part. The buyer, there are still buyers out there looking. There are plenty of households and families that are not necessarily rate sensitive, um, but they are cash strapped, and I think they're still struggling because then and the supply is still low. So you know, we're seeing competition on. Single family homes between two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand, six hundred thousand dollars. Competition is still very, very high among those buy, among those uh, those properties because there's just not enough supply out there. Uh, I think that if supply increases and we start to potentially see some price reductions, I think what we'll also see is some seller concessions that will help create buyers where there currently aren't. In other words someone who can afford the payment, someone who wants to live in the neighborhood, but just doesn't have the money for down payment and closing costs. I think you're going to start to see some concessions to lighten that burden from the, from the buyer side, which would be great. It would be nice to see. So, so what does a buyer need to do to improve the chances of their offer being accepted? And it's uh, it's all about preparation, Doug. It is all about preparation right now because you got to be able to strike while the iron's hot, and you got to put your best foot forward. Two cliches back to back. How do you like that? But the reality <laughs> is, you have to you have to do the the, the fully underwritten pre approvals. I know not every company out there offers it, but you, you want to be able to get your file fully underwritten before you even put an offer in, uh, where credit, income, assets are all evaluated and signed off on by an underwriter because that's gonna really position you and, and, and for, for success, it's gonna allow you to close quickly. And it's really what the sellers are looking for right now. They wanna make sure that they remove as many variables as possible because they may be taking an offer that's actually not as high for stability purposes. You know, uh, someone who's, who's far more qualified, maybe offering a little bit less, they're relying on those qualifications that are relying on the buyer's ability to close quickly and, 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 and effortlessly right now. So, uh, so that's the best thing a buyer can do you know, in this market to, to prepare for, uh, you know, for putting in an offer. Great. That's, That's very good, good advice. Speaking of interest rates though, Doug, how, how are interest rates impacting your clients portfolios? What impact is the, uh, the higher rates having on your folks? Well, you know, 
a lot of people uh, look to bonds as as sort of the ballast in a portfolio, a stabilizer, if you will, because generally speaking, you know, money is going to move to the most is fungible. It's going to move to the most efficient users. And when stock prices go down, those funds, you it's usually because there's more sellers than buyers. Uh, that cash has to go somewhere. And it oftentimes goes into bonds, treasuries, for example. In 2022, what we saw is with the increase in interest rates, um, people were concerned about uh, the, that rise in interest rates and sold off bonds. So when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. You could buy a bond today for $1,000 earning 4%. And then six months from now, if, if somebody can pay $1,000 for a 6% bond, are you going to get $1,000 for your 4% bond? No. But if you hold it to maturity, you'll get your $1,000 back and you'll get interest at 4% per year until such time as, as your bond matures. Well, during that intermittent time between the time a bond is sold and the time it it's matures, that price is going to fluctuate. Well, one of the things that we've seen recently is that Bonds at the longer end of the term, meaning like 20 year treasuries and 30 year treasuries have actually gone down dramatically in price because interest rates have gone up. It's starting to happen at the long end of the curve. And that, unfortunately, for those people who are had, were positioned at the long end of the curve, they felt that in their portfolio. Generally speaking, though, when interest rates rise, most managers will reduce their what's known as duration uh, and put more money, more fixed income in the port, uh, positions in the portfolio at the shorter end of the curve. T-bills, two years, because that that is less likely to be impacted by the fluctuation in interest rates. Sure. So do you see, do you expect the, do you expect that trend to continue? That's a great question. You know, the only way to know is to see things play out. But uh, as we've seen recently, the Fed has kind of paused on interest rate hikes. I think there's a number of reasons for that. One, you know, we've got uh, we, we've seen uh, some areas of the market in terms of inflation, uh, some inflationary indicators actually come down. So the rate of increase in prices has actually slowed down, which is a good thing. And that's the whole reason why the Fed's raising interest rates is to combat inflation. Um, but with geopolitical risk, with the Treasury issuing more bonds, that's had what we call a, a technical impact on, on bond prices, meaning, you know, with more supply than there is demand, prices are, are going to go down, Right. Uh, and so the, and that's what's really caused a lot of this uh, turmoil at the, the longer end of the curve, the 20 and 30 year bonds. So, um, you know, we think the Fed is, is going to pause for now, higher for longer. But we also think that there's an opportunity for uh, markets to rebalance and come back to sort of normal pricing. Because you remember, for the longest time, we had uh, the 800-pound gorilla in the room, the Federal Reserve, with it, with you know a, a weight on interest rates for a long time, and that really impacted the market. So, uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna see things probably normalize in the next six to twelve months in terms of uh, pricing and interest rates in the Treasury markets. You know, from your lips to God's ears. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I hope it's I hope I'm right too. You know, we have a, a viewer question today, and it came from James Rock of Philadelphia, and he asked, "How do you get a license to sell mortgages? Because you know, you mortgage guys are making all kinds of money these days, right?" James, I will ask answer that question with a question: Why in the world would you want to get a mortgage license right now? Um, no, but it is uh, you know the, the industry is it's a phenomenal industry. And it's a great way to build relationships and, 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 you know, um, and help people. And that's what I love about it. So, so if you are looking to get licensed, it really depends on the channel you go into. If you decide you want to work for a federally chartered bank, 
then it's really just a matter of getting registered. Now, those banks may have their own versions of, you know, uh, education requirements in order to work there. But federally speaking, you're only required to get registered. If you're going to work for a state chartered bank or a broker, then you have to go through the National Mortgage Licensing System, the NMLS, and you have to do your SAFE Act training, which is uh, an upfront 20 hour uh, education along with state uh, education for the states that you want to be licensed in. And once you uh, once you complete your training, you're eligible to apply for and get sponsored by a bank or by a, a state chartered institution to to obtain your license. And at that point, you're late, you're, you're eligible to originate loans uh, in various states that you choose to uh, to get licensed in. So and then, of course, each year you're required to do continuing education, which is tons of fun. And uh, and, and you make sure that you stay sharp on your ethics and on your compliance and on your laws um, that govern the industry. So um, it's a it's a it's a great industry, James. And, uh, you know, I hope if you decide to get into it, that uh, that you find it a path that the path uh, worthwhile. Thanks, James, for sending that in. If you'd like to get your questions answered, you can send them to Money Matters. Like by following these instructions. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, TV dot com. So real estate investing and interest rates are inextricably tied to each other, with low interest rates often uh, fueling growth and and development and high rates stopping it in its tracks the recent rise in rates combined with the the work from home policies that the pandemic have uh have impacted many areas of the real estate market with that i'd like to introduce our guest today matthew cullison managing director of capital markets for newmark a world leader in commercial real estate seamlessly powering every phase of the property life cycle welcome matt to money matters tv Hey Doug. Hey Ken. Nice to nice to uh, be on your show. I'm at you know, big big picture. What's the state of the debt market these days? Yeah, I, I was listening to your um, your your question earlier in the show, and uh, I might suggest to to, the, to that person calling in that maybe he sits out the real estate market for like another six months or so because it's a little slow right now to to answer your question. As you guys were saying, interest rates have jumped up dramatically in the last 18 months. And, and what I'm seeing is it's kind of frozen the market. Um, you know, debt is really the, the lifeblood of real estate. So when, when rates jump up dramatically, you know, nobody's doing discretionary refinances, which we saw a lot of during the pandemic and, and properties aren't selling because, um, you know, a, a property is worth less than what it were than what it was worth just a couple of years ago. And, and people can't borrow as much to, to buy real estate. So, so right now we're sort of waiting for the market adapt to this new reality. And it's probably going to take a few more months for that to happen. Um, you know, sellers right now still want to get, they still want to get the price that they could have gotten a year ago. And, um, but in the meantime, buyers know that that values have to come down and we're sort of waiting to see, we're waiting for that to happen. Um, the other issue, the other thing that I'm sort of seeing in the marketplace right now, and and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, is is um, the the banks have kind of pulled out of lending, not, not not entirely, but but they've stepped back a lot from what they were lending a couple of years ago. Um, in a normal market, the banks make up about forty percent of commercial mortgages, um, but but they're under a little bit more scrutiny today, you know, given the bank failures that happened in the spring. Um, they're having to reserve more money against potential bad loans that could be on their books. And so that that's kind of um, tied up their balance sheets. It, it's making it harder for them to lend. And it's really leaving a void in sort of the commercial debt market, because 
you know, there's lots of other capital sources out there, but they can easily, you know, replace the lender that was responsible for 40% of the market. Matt, quick question for you. I know that we have, that we're going to see maturity uh, in the next 12 months. Uh, some of these, uh, you know, uh, some of these notes are going to come due. How do you think that's going to impact the market? Is that going to trigger uh, activity? Yeah, so so it's interesting. Um, we have a big wave of loan maturities coming up over the next couple of years. And, you know, you know, I, in, in the commercial mortgage spa space, I'm usually dealing with loans, you know, anywhere from two to three years to 10 to 15 years. Um, and, you know, for loans coming off of a 10 year term, um, they've had a lot of time to amortize before their maturity. And they've also had time for, you know, cash flow to grow, you know, rents to grow over the span of 10 years. Um, the issue that we're sort of seeing and expecting to see more of over the next year is that a lot of mortgages were originated during the pandemic when interest rates plummeted. Um, and those loans haven't had a lot of time to amortize and they haven't had a lot of time to um, experience rent growth. And so the question is, you know, for, for the, and you can see in this chart, um, if, if you look at, um, it shows $1.9 trillion of mortgages uh, maturing between 2023 and 2025. And um, actually, uh, Ken and Doug, this wasn't, this wasn't the uh, chart I wanted to show just yet. Are, are you able to pull up the other one? No, not this one. There you go. There you go. This is really what I wanted to show. Um, so, so this shows that um, a third of the mortgages maturing over the next couple of years, um, if you look at the, the, the dark gray highlighted section, um, those were all originated during the pandemic between 20 and 2021. So that's when interest rates were at all time lows and values were at all time highs. And so those those loans are going to be maturing, you know, in, in the span of over the next couple of years. And they've only been they've only been around for three or four years. So they, there hasn't been a lot of time for amortization and there hasn't been time for the for the rent to grow. So the big question is, um, you know, how are these loans going to exit at rates significantly higher than where they were started? Um, and, and, and I guess just to just to give you a little example, um, um, let, let's say you had an apartment property that was generating a $1 million NOI in 2020. Um, that would have qualified for a mortgage of, a, of about 15.8 million in 2020 at a 3% interest rate. Um, over the span of three years, that, that mortgage could have matured, they could have amortized down to a $14.8 million balance. Um, so, so flash forward to today, uh, interest rates for that same property would probably be about 7%. So 3% to 7%. Um, let, let's assume that maybe rents have grown 5% a year over the last three years. So that same million dollar NOI might be up to, you know, 1 million 160. At, at a 7% interest rate, that property is only going to qualify for an $11.6 million mortgage. So that's, so that's four million, so it's I'm 4 sorry. million less. It's four million less than what it would have qualified for in 2020. Wow, that that's that's what I was going to allude to. Is that you know that big swing has got to be painful. Yeah. So so if you do the math for for mortgages that were being originated in 2020 and 2021 at at all time low rates, um, if they're maturing today and if they have to be refinanced today um, at, at the same constraints and typically lenders are sizing to a 125 debt service coverage. So that means they want the property cash flow to exceed the mortgage payments by 25%. Um, pr properties probably have to have grown their net operating income by 45 to 50% over the last three years to be able to refinance at that same loan amount. And that, that's, a, that's a, it's going to be a challenge, I think, for a lot of mortgages maturing over the, over the next couple of years. And, you know, it sort of remains to be seen quite how that's going to play out. I mean, what, yeah, what, what I, can, I can see that creating a lot of pain for, for the, the lenders. Who are the, the big lenders that have exposure in this market? 
Yeah, and, and so that yeah, so that's the other interesting thing. So um, if if you could pull up the uh, the other chart that I there there you go. So so over the next couple of years, um, banks have a lot of exposure in the commercial mortgage market. Um, they're lenders that typically lend on shorter term durations. So a lot of their mortgages will be, you know, construction loans, two to three years or, or permanent loans up to five to seven years. But, but they were very active uh, lending on commercial real estate um, over the past five years. And so, so they have a lot of maturity exposure um, coming up and, and, you know, that, that's, you know, that, that's where I, where I think there's going to be some pain. Um, th and they're also just not easily, they're not as easily able to refinance or extend those mortgages as well because under more regulator scrutiny. Um, so, um, so, um, yeah, so, 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 you know, we're, we're expecting to see more of this over the next 12 months. The, the other lender that was, um, the, uh, the, the, this, the dark green, um, segment of those of those bar charts those are debt fund loans um they were also a very active um lending product during the um during the pandemic um and they were mostly floating rate mortgages and 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 in most cases when borrowers were were taking out those mortgages they were required to buy rate caps to kind of minimize their rate exposure over a, a two to three year term but now now you have those rate caps are expiring um, and, 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 and to purchase a replacement cap today with, 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 you know, with short-term rates having increased from 25 bips to five and a quarter, you know, th those rate caps are a lot more expensive. And so, so, you know, b borrowers that have to refinance out of those floating rate loans, th they're also going to be challenged because the rate caps are more expensive. The floating rates are more expensive. And there's a good chance that, you know, um, that their properties aren't going to qualify for the same amount of debt that they were able to borrow a couple of years ago. Matt, this sounds, sounds catastrophic. I mean, if you think about it, like number one, you know, how are the lenders and the borrowers going to deal with this, this, this gap between they might need 1.4 or $14 million, let's say to, to, to refinance the debt, but they're only eligible for 11 million or, you know, or yeah, $11 million. You know, who's going to make up Are the bank's going to take a haircut and say, OK, well, you know, we'll let you go on that on that three, four million dollars. Are the are the the property owners going to need to come up with that cash? Like what 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 happens in those situations? And, yeah, and, and so the properties came down in value. That doesn't even address the, the issue there with uh, distressed properties. Yeah, so th this this is playing out as we speak, and it's going to continue to play out over the next several months. Um, there's kind of three things that can happen when when a loan is maturing and, and it's not able to be refinanced out. Um, the lender can foreclose and take title to the property, but you know that's that's really an ideal situation for the lender because you know the the foreclosure process is is long and costly, and that and and most likely you know that. If, if they're foreclosing, there's a, there's a decent chance that, that the value of the property might be less than the loan balance. Um, so, so either way, they're probably looking at a loss on the property. So, um, so that, that's not really an ideal situation for the lenders. And the other thing is if, if they foreclose on the properties, you know, and, until they sell the assets, they also have to, um, they also have to manage the real estate and not every lender is set up to be, to be, uh, to be managing, you know, apartment properties or office buildings, you know, that takes work. Um, so that's one option. Um, a, a, another option is, you know, the bar can either sell the property or come out of, po out of pocket with cash to to refinance their debt. But you know, not every not every spon not every borrower is in position to stroke a check for a couple million dollars, um, and and they and they're not really incentivized to necessarily sell that asset either. Um, because there's a good chance that that property is worth less than what they would have paid for it a few years ago. Um, so, you know, if, if they do sell today, you know, at, at sort of, you know, a, a, what's really at the bottom of, of the real estate market in, in terms of what we've seen in the last 10 years, um, you know, th there's a good chance that they're going to lose all their equity. Um, so, you know, the, the third option is um, 
borrowers and lenders can try to negotiate some sort of loan extension or modification, this can give you know both sides a, a chance to either grow the cash flow a little bit or or you know wait for a better interest rate environment you know that'll help them you know refinance out of their current loan um but you know it, it, th that's that's a conversation that has to play take place and it and it raises some interesting questions you know are interest rates actually going to be better in a year so that extending the loan is is going to um really improve the lender's position um right. in, in the case of an office property you know uh, office vacancies have jumped up a lot um, since the pandemic, but they're still rising. So, so that, that's sort of a declining asset type. And so, you know, if, if, if you're, if you're a lender on an office asset, you might be better off, you know, taking title of the property or, or selling your loan today versus extending that because, you know, the value of your loan it might only get worse if, if by waiting a year. Um, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how these things play out. Um, but, but right now, the, right now, I think, um, you know, we have, we haven't seen as much distress as, as sort of what we're expecting to see in 2024. Um, we, we think right now, you know, borrowers and lenders are kind of, you know, they're kind of at the negotiating table and trying to figure out what's the next best step. Yeah. You know, it's funny when you said that the first words that came to my mind were extend and, and pretend which were very popular back after the financial crisis of 2008. Hopefully we're not going to see something like that play out again, because, uh, you know, typically when you see something as disruptive as that, the market and the players have a tendency to adjust for it in hopes that it doesn't happen again to keep it from repeat history from repeating itself. This has really been great, Matt. You know, we, uh, and thank you for being our guest today and providing such informative and insightful information for our viewers. Uh, I also want to thank Ken for, for co-hosting. Ken, it was great. Be sure to tune in to our next show when Monica Eaton, the founder and CEO of Chargebacks 911, will explain how her company helps businesses manage chargebacks on their credit card transactions. Most importantly, we thank you, our viewers, for tuning in to Money Matters TV, where your money matters.